Now we're going to look at something called the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. This is the distribution of molecular speeds. So it's going to be very much related to the um, distribution of kinetic energy that molecules will have. And it's not an easy function to look at, but uh, we'll, we'll analyze it a little bit, throw a little calculus around, but try to stick with the, you know, mostly conceptually what's going on um, with this particular function. So if I look at what the molecules are doing in a collection of, a collection of molecules in a gas, what I noticed is that molecules are moving at all different speeds. At lower temperatures, they are moving, according to this curve right here, okay? It's not a symmetric curve. They're moving um, on average, um, you know, at, I shouldn't say on average, because that, that's talking about the entire collection. Uh, the um, average velocities, the, the square, the average of the velocity squared, of course, is related to the temperature. But uh, we have some molecules that are moving very slowly. We have some molecules that are moving very quickly. But most of the molecules are right around this peak in the center. Okay. Now, notice the asymmetry to this uh, function. This function, okay, I didn't do a good job of that. Okay, I'm gonna do, there we go. If I look at this function, it peaks right at the center of that blue line, okay? That, that top of the peak of this distribution represents the most probable velocity at which I'm gonna find a particular molecule, okay? Now we can see that on the left side, I have all these molecules right here. And on the right side, I have all these molecules here. It's definitely not symmetric. I have many more to the right of that most probable velocity than I have on the left. Okay, so that's, that's why we say it's not symmetric. Now, um, if I heat up the gas to a much higher temperature, let's say I go from 300 degrees Kelvin and I increase it to three times, three times the uh, temperature. What I notice is my most probable velocity has not moved three times further to the right. My most probable velocity is increased by a factor of the square root of three, okay? And again, that's because temperature is, is is related to, is proportional to the average kinetic energy of the molecules. The average kinetic energy of the molecules, of course, is related to this, the square of the velocity on average, okay? So when I heat a gas, I still have lots of these molecules at lower velocities. There are just fewer of them. I have more molecules now moving at higher velocities and that's why our overall internal energy increases relatively proportional to the temperature of the gas. Okay, how do I get this curve? How do I get this curve? Okay, it's this ugly function right here. Now, ignore the constants. We got lots of constants right here. Lots and lots of constants that we want to just you know, not dwell on too much. Um, okay, you know, uh, what's contained in here, we have four, the square root of pi, the Boltzmann const constant. Um, the temperature is in there. The temperature is in there, uh, as is the mass. But um, the main part of, of what we want to, to look at here is this V squared, okay, V squared, and again, we're gonna ignore lots of you know, constants in here, constants in here. And the other thing we have is this e to the v squared. So really what this, this function is, is it's the product of 
you know, two fairly common functions that we come across um, in math. And again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna graph here, I'm gonna graph probability of a molecule as a function of velocity. Okay, so here's my velocity here. Here's my probability. That's, that's my um, F of V. Okay, my probability of finding the function, a molecule at that, that velocity. And here is my V, okay? Now, if I were to graph just the V squared, again, I can have a constant out front, that's fine. If I were just to graph V squared, that would be a parabola. It would look something like that, right? That would be a parabola. If I were to graph, so let's, let's put a little box around that V squared. <laughs> if I were to graph this exponential function, okay, it's, you know, comparable to e to the minus x squared <coughs> or ax squared, however you want to do, do that. That function looks more like this. I didn't do a good job of that. Let me try to redraw that. That function looks more like this. Okay. Now, if I combine the two, okay, I take the product of the two, that gives me my Boltzmann distribution. Okay, that gives me my Boltzmann distribution. Didn't do a good job of that, but it's definitely asymmetric. It's definitely that asymmetric curve. <coughs> and again, it gets a shape from this, this squared curve and this uh, exponential squared. Okay, obviously we've got other constants in there, but that's where it gets its, its uh, shape from. And if you, you just ignore all the other constants that are going on there, you can say, oh yeah, I can, I can see that. There's my V squared, there's my exponential to the squared power, negative squared power, okay? So um, for every gas, we can look at this, this probability function and, and identify uh, three different velocities. What's my most probable velocity? VP, what is, sometimes we call that VMP. What is my average velocity? That can be written a number of different ways. Sometimes we use this. And what is my root mean squared velocity? We saw that that was much higher than what we called our average velocity related to the speed of sound. So, you know, physically, you know, if I were just to pick out one molecule, it would be most probably traveling at VP. If I were to measure the speed of sound, which is related to the average velocity, you know, that would be the number I'd come up with here. And then our RMS velocity would be that. Okay, so there are three different parts of this curve right here when I graph this function. Um, and here you can see it, right? my most probable, that's the peak of the curve. Okay, let me use a different color. Maybe be consistent with our drawing. Our peak of the curve is right there. That's where the slope is neither going up nor going down. My average velocity is right here. And then my RMS velocity is right here. Okay. And again, if you think about RMS, we're averaging the squares so the uh, higher velocity molecules are gonna contribute more to the average of the squares than um, when we take the average of just the velocity itself. That's why that, that VRMS is higher than, than the average velocity. Okay, how do I find an expression for each using this function right here, this horrible function? Okay. Let me start with most probable. In calculus, we know that the slope of any function is equal to the first derivative. So uh, if on that, that peak right there, where it's neither going up nor going down, the slope is zero at VP, I can set that the derivative of that function 
to zero. Yay, calculus, right? So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take that, that ugly expression from the Boltzmann distribution, and I'm going to um, take the first derivative with respect to velocity, set it equal to zero, and solve for our V. And yeah, it's not great. But again, don't look so much at the math. <clears throat> we are just taking this and we are setting the derivative to zero. Um, again, we get some crazy constants out there. And when we solve for this, we can solve for V, uh, we get the square root of two times the gas constant times the temperature divided by the molar mass or 2 kVT divided by the mass of each molecule, okay? So VP, uh, our most probable velocity is the smallest of these velocities that I'm, that I'm deriving here, okay? And again, um, think about the principle of what I'm doing here. I'm looking at where the slope goes to zero, okay? The slope is zero at a maxima, where it's, it's zero at a minima. Here we have the maxima on this function, and we found that. Let me now go to the average velocity. So we have our first expression. What is the average velocity? Okay, what is the mean velocity, um, average velocity of the molecules? Well, how am I going to do that? I can take the average of this function. Right, I can integrate it from zero, which is a velocity equal to zero, all the way to infinity in this function. And again, uh, it's not gonna cause the function to blow up here because as we go to infinity, the function goes to zero. Uh, so I integrate the velocity with the probability of the velocity, and that's gonna give me an average. That's normally how we find averages when we have this a, a function like this, we can integrate. And as we integrate, <laughs> the calculus gets a little bit messy. And um, as I go through it, we are integrating uh, V cubed times E to the, again, a constant negative, constant times V squared. And um, as we come through here, we come up with this value right here. And notice it's a little bit bigger than my value for most probable. For most probable, I got the square root of two kBT over M. Okay, here, two has been replaced by eight over pi, eight over pi. Now, pi is 3.14159, whatever. Eight divided by that if I divided eight by four, I'd get two, but here I'm getting a little bit more that than um, than uh, three, three point one four one five nine. So uh, eight divided by three is going to be a little bit greater than two, and um, that's what we expect. We expect the mean velocity to be a little bit larger. Okay, so now I have an expression for my average velocity. Okay, let's now look for the RMS because we derived the RMS velocity earlier using um, you know, our, our laws of mechanics, using Newton's law, using Newtonian mechanics. Uh, we're looking at RMS now and um, Oh, I don't derive it using the function. I lied. Uh, I just take the earlier thing that we got. And of course, uh, we get uh, square root of three RT over M with square root of three KB T over M. I got lazy here. And I feel like messing with a function there. Uh, but in any case, <clears throat> actually that gets really messy because you've got to do your expectation and integrate with respect to V squared. I apologize for not showing that, but um, if you look at it, again, um, looking at our different values, uh, VP, which is the most probable, went by the square root of 2RT over M. 
Larger than that was our average, which was the square root of eight over pi RT over M. And now this is the largest value. This is our RMS, which goes by this, okay? Each velocity represents different parts of the curve. We're talking about different things, okay? But all are a function of temperature, as you can see here. All are proportional to the square root of the temperature, okay? What are some applications of this? Why do we mess with this Boltzmann comp, uh, distribution if it's such an ugly function um, to play around with? Well, it tells us a lot about what's going on. And again, um, as we talked about earlier, the um, average velocity of, of uh, lighter gases is much higher at a given temperature than is for heavier gases. And here, uh, there is a maximal Boltzmann distribution for helium, just these are, these are uh, the noble gases, uh, for neon, for argon, and then the xenon, which is a really uh, heavy noble gas. And clearly, as the mass goes up, the distribution shifts down to the lower velocities. As the mass uh, goes down, the distribution shifts to a higher velocity. So we can get these higher velocity distributions simply by dropping the mass. But remember, going back to this original equation, sorry, I'm, I'm going back so many, that um, not only does the mass okay, affect where this curve is situated, the temperature is also in that, but in the opposite direction. So, Shifting to smaller masses pushes the curve to higher velocities. Obviously, increasing the temperature also shifts the curve to higher velocities. So the higher the temperature, uh, the greater the kinetic energy of these. And this shows uh, Boltzmann distributions at different temperatures from right around liquid nitrogen all the way up to um, you know, 1,000 you know, over a thousand degrees Kelvin. And we can see that, you know, we're dealing with the same area under each of these curves, by the way, okay? The total area, if we, if we integrate over this probability curve, total area represents the number of molecules and they shift to higher and higher values as the temperature goes up. So that flattens out the curve. Now in chemistry, um, you know, I haven't done chemistry in, in decades, so you'll have to, you'll have to, you know, put up with my, my poor knowledge of chemistry. But uh, one thing that we notice in chemistry is that chemical reactions go faster as you increase the temperature. How do we explain this? Well, if we think about the Boltzmann distribution, um, we know that in a particular sample of molecules, it can be a gas or it can be a liquid. We've got molecules traveling at all different velocities, okay? You can apply this to a liquid, by the way. Now, um, at a lower temperature, at a lower temperature, you will have fewer high energy molecules. And if there is a potential well, a, a barrier, that the molecules have to overcome before they can interact, they can bond uh, or exchange electrons, okay? Um, a lower temperature means there are fewer molecules available to engage in this reaction, so the reaction is gonna go much slower. The other thing is the smaller the barrier before the interaction can take place, the lower the activation energy, as we say in chemistry, um, the faster the reaction is gonna go. And uh, we know we can add catalysts to sometimes lower that barrier to lower the activation energy and accelerate the, uh, the reaction. So again, looking at this on the right, here is the threshold, you know, the energy needed to get these molecules going fast enough that they can overcome some type of potential well barrier before they can interact, well, only a few molecules qualify for that, 
okay? Now I add a catalyst, which is gonna lower that barrier, okay? Lower the activation energy. And guess what? My reaction speeds up. Many more molecules participate in the reaction. So it's gonna go a lot faster. Likewise, with a chemical reaction, if I'm at a lower temperature, again, not many molecules are gonna be available to participate, right? I increase the temperature, my Boltzmann distribution slides to a higher velocity. Now I've got more available. My reaction goes faster with increasing temperature. You know, if you wanna apply this in terms of biological systems, um, think about, you know, the temperature of our bodies. Our, we are homeotherms. We try to keep our bodies at a very set temperature. Why? Because we want the right reactions to occur and we don't want the wrong reactions to, to take place, okay? Our body temperatures are um, set where they are because um, if we lower the temperature too much, too few molecules would be available to participate in life-sustaining reactions and we would begin to suffer from hypothermia and we would eventually die, okay? In fact, we can lower the temperature of the body uh, if we lower it around 70 degrees Fahrenheit, which they do during open heart surgery, the heart will stop. The chemical reactions needed to get the, the, um, the muscles to contract in the heart they don't work anymore at that low temperature, okay? There aren't enough molecules available to overcome that activation energy and activity stops, okay? Clinically, you're dead. On the other hand, if our temperature goes too high, what begins to happen is reactions that we don't wanna have happen start, okay? Um, our proteins begin to break down because enzymes start taking them apart, proteins begin to unfold. And, uh, you know, that is, uh, you know, just as dangerous as too low of a temperature, if not more. Um, I know when I've had a fever, I feel miserable afterward uh, because my body's raised the temperature because it wants a higher level of enzyme activity, which is all part of my immune system. If it goes too high, however, becomes dangerous as my body begins to break itself down. So Boltzmann distribution very much connect, uh, connected with chemical reactions, the rate of chemical reactions, okay? And if we take it into biological systems, we can, again, apply what's happening with the chemical reactions to these biological systems, okay? Too little temperature, too few chemical reactions to sustain life. Um, too high of a temperature, dangerous chemical reactions that begin to break down living tissue, okay? Um, we can also look at this Boltzmann distribution and apply it to planetary atmospheres. Uh, hopefully you're well aware that we have eight planets in the solar system, I know. Some people still want to think Pluto's a planet, but I'm not gonna have that discussion here. Um, hydrogen and helium are the most abundant elements in the universe, okay? But yet our atmosphere is mainly oxygen and nitrogen, oxygen from biological activity and nitrogen just because as we're seeing, it's available. The giant planets are mainly hydrogen and helium. So it's no surprise that up here, hydrogen and helium, Neptune and Uranus, a little less hydrogen and helium. Why are there atmospheres? It's hydrogen and helium, because that was the most abundant elements available when these planets formed. And if we look at the Boltzmann distribution, okay, even though these lighter gases can be traveling at very, very high speeds, the speeds are well below the escape velocity of these atoms, okay? But what about on Earth? On Earth, hydrogen and helium in the atmosphere? Well, they're moving so fast, they get into the upper atmosphere where they can become 
heated by, by solar radiation and just throw off into space. They have enough kinetic energy to overcome the gravitational energy well of Earth. So any hydrogen and helium in our atmosphere, gone, okay? But oxygen and nitrogen, they're, further, they're the other way on the Boltzmann distribution. There are not enough molecules to escape into space. Um, so they stay as part of our atmosphere. Now, Mars, it has a smaller escape velocity. So it has lost, you know, perhaps 99% of its atmosphere off into space. Unlike Earth, which is mainly nitrogen and oxygen, we did have carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, but biological processes converted that mainly into oxygen. Um, most of the carbon dioxide was also converted into carbonates uh, geologically. Don't want to offend the geologists. Most geology got rid of most of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Biology kind of finished up the re remainder. But Mars has lost most of its atmosphere just because it's too small. And with an outer magnetic field to protect it, it's pretty much getting um, you know, the remaining atmosphere lost in the space. Okay, the moon, why does the moon have an atmosphere? Well, it's gravity is so weak that anything, anything in an atmosphere that we put in the moon would simply just drift off into space um, at, the, at the higher velocities, okay? So again, um, Mars, you know, we talk about terraforming Mars, are we gonna make it Earth-like? <laughs> yeah, right, it's lost most of its atmosphere. Okay, it once was much warmer and probably had a more, um, you know, you know, sustainable atmosphere for, for life at an earlier time. But again, most of that was lost in the space. And again, you can think about it this way. Even if half of a percent of the molecules in your atmosphere have enough energy to escape, you're gonna leak atmosphere into space, okay? And this Boltzmann distribution, again, very much tells us why certain planets have the atmospheres that they do and why some bodies in the, in the solar system don't have any atmosphere at all, okay? Again, go back to this chart right here. Uh, Pluto has really barely an atmosphere at all of nitrogen, even though it's super, super cold and that should shift the Boltzmann distribution very, very low. Uh, most of the moons of, of um, yeah, all of the moons of Jupiter also lack a sufficient atmosphere. Mercury has no atmosphere. The moon has no atmosphere. There's just not enough gravitational force. So the escape velocities are very, very low, okay? Mars is a sort of intermediate, okay? sort of intermediate, still has a little bit of an atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is a very heavy gas, but most of the atmosphere has been lost. Earth and, and Venus, yes, uh, relatively thick atmospheres, okay? Because their gravitational forces are large enough to hold on to these gases. And of course, to the greatest extreme, uh, the giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus, all have pretty much held on to their hydrogen and helium, okay? Neptune and Uranus are a little bit more methane rich being smaller planets. Some of the hydrogen and helium has, uh, did escape at one time, but for the most part, they were dominated by, by those elements, okay?